We had the, all the lumber sawed for the boat right here in eastern Tennessee so that it would be local wood just like the Pioneers did. All the, the boards that the boat are made out of are heavy dimensional 2 by 10s There are some boards in there that are 2 by 22 and so that's what the Pioneers primarily used because the lumber was uh, soft and easy to work and prior to steam coming into the valley they had to cut it by hand with a pit saw. So it's very difficult to, to, to build a boat and get all the material to build a boat. Uh, then uh, the boat uh, probably weighs about four ton uh, because of the weight of the wood and everything. It only draws about 12 inches of water because of the flat bottom. It's 12 feet wide and about 40 feet long. So you have a pretty good sized flat bottom boat that could haul a lot of uh, salt down the river and that's the whole purpose for it was to haul salt and haul furs and things that they would like to sell. So if you go inside, you'll get to see all the things that pioneers basically would have had in the 1820s. <clears throat> right here on the front of the boat is a fireplace. And fire was one of their problems, but they still wanted to cook and they didn't want to stop and have to build a fire on shore. So many times they would just build them a cooking fire right here on the boat and keep on floating down the river. And they had furs like that mink that's laying over there and deer skins and they sold all of that kind of stuff. They would, this was great trapping territory, great hunting territory and those furs were very important to people on down river to make clothing and, and various uh, pouches and trunks and things out of. So they carried everything. <clears throat> you see a lot of iron on here. You see a lot of things that people would have traded. They, they carried things down river they could sell to farmers, to, to settlers like horse harness and horse collars, skillets, hames, scrap iron, various things that were very valuable back in those days. You couldn't get it. And so if you had opportunity to buy it, uh, they had these big old heavy tables. They didn't really build much furniture because the furniture took up space. So they would sleep on the floor on a pallet, maybe out of a quilt, or maybe on a deer skin was how they slept at night. They didn't need a bed, and they didn't hardly ever use chairs. Uh, if you had fancy furniture, you wouldn't have put it out on the boat. You would have, it would have been in a crate being, being delivered to somebody for money. So we got some traps, and uh, you might notice these around 1820, during early, late 1700s to 1820, candles were basic the way you would light the place. So we have some tin, tin smiths made lanterns like this, copper smiths made lanterns like this. And uh, this is basically, it was very busy. They just, they lived here. People lived here. It was utilitarian. That bread's pretty old. We tried to cut it, but we couldn't do any good with it. Where did they put the salt? The salt would be in barrels on the back, on the front, and some in here. We've got, you know, we got a various a sundry different things that they would have hauled to sell and things they would have lived with, but they put as much salt on here as this boat would carry over the shallow water. You got to keep in mind these rivers were shallow. A wide, flat boat was what you needed, and you could only, you know, one extra keg might mean you couldn't get there. So they would, they would calculate how much weight they could carry. This boat would carry a lot of weight, tonnage, because it's wide, flat bottom, and you can calculate what it would carry and how deep it would sink. And they were really good at that kind of thing. How many days before they get to New Orleans? It depends on a lot of things. It depends on which way the wind's blowing on a given day, because they might have to tie off to a tree and, rather than go back upstream. Well, the wind could blow a boat like this back upriver. It all depended on the current. This was a downriver boat that basically floated with the current. Sometimes they would row it a little bit. Sometimes they would pole it. Sometimes they would put a sail up if they had tailwind. But a river so crooked that you wouldn't that wouldn't last too long. And they had a term called cordelling, where they would run a rope out to a 300 feet tight to a tree and pull the boat, speed it up a little and send, send that rope out again. And now that was one method that you could go back upstream if you had to. But this is not an upstream boat. This boat never went upriver, hardly ever. They would take it, they, they didn't bring it back. When they, this boat got to Memphis or Nashville or New Orleans, they tore it apart and built houses out of it. And Natchez, Vicksburg, New Orleans, Baton Rouge, they were all built out of flatboat materials originally. Yeah, this is a floating lumber yard actually. Yeah. Really. So these boats never came back. And that's just the way it was. They came back on horses. Came back up the Natchez Trace if they were that far down on uh, horseback. And then eventually 
uh, coming into the 1820 to 30s, they started building keel boats to come back up. So they'd put a point on it, and it, it wouldn't float as much cargo going down, but it would come back up by the hardest. So you had to pole it or cordell it. So coming up river was almost impossible. Going right down river was the cheapest way to deliver goods to market. And that was a fact. So they really didn't worry about putting too much finish on the There was no finish on this boat. Nothing fancy on this boat. Yeah, it was a lumber pile and it was a means to carry salt, furs, tobacco, corn, vegetables, chickens, pigs, whatever going down river that you could raise on a farm up here. They put it on a boat and sent it down. This is just a hauling boat. That's all it was made for. Did they kind of sleep on the benches? Well, they would sleep on benches or on the floor more likely because, you know, furniture was in the way to those folks. And it was, it was hard, you know, why would you waste your time building furniture when you could make money doing something else? Blacksmiths would set up on shore and make nails. People would whittle pegs to build boats. Whittle knives, forks, whatever you could think of, spinning wheels. They would cut dogwood down and make spindles for spinning wheels out of dogwood. They understood what each tree was good for. There's a barrel up here in the Netherlands Inn that's made out of sycamore, and that's a very good barrel-making tree because it had a twisted grain to it so it wouldn't split out like an oak barrel would. So the <clears throat> Everything, right. Making iron, making nails, blacksmithery. How much nail? I know you used stuff. Well, nails were in it besides pegging. Uh, in, a, in a normal, depends on obviously how big. There were flat boats built with no nails. But I, I have a, some information out of a, a document from New Orleans where there was a group of guys that made their living on a sandbar. If you didn't want your flat boat, they'd give you $3 for it and burn it and clean up all the nails and they could sell those nails for about six bucks and double their money rather than have a blacksmith make another nail. See, so there were all kinds of people that figured out ways to make a living. I mean, there was just ways of making a living and it was like two or $3 a week or two or $3 a month. I've got a document that says that uh, they were building flat boats of on the upper Ohio and Kanawha River for twelve dollars a boat of this size right here. I know carpenters in World War II that made blocks drill, <clears throat> tore down houses, mm -hmm. and drove the nails in to straighten them to rebuild them. Oh sure, sure, yeah. People were very ingenuitive. They didn't waste anything. They would kill the deer, eat it, take the hide, use the sinew, use the bone. Everything could be used for something. Nothing was ever wasted, unfortunately, like we are today. <laughs> we should take lessons. The, you're saying transporting the salt down the river. How do they waterproof that? To, I mean, it's obviously, you've got shelter here. And <clears throat> well, water, water, there were two problems. They had moisture and water and fire. So they, they were always concerned about burning the boat in one way or another. You know, and ever they smoked pipes and things, but waterproofing is a, there, huh? waterproofing was a uh, a big problem, and they had ways of doing. It. They would take skins and soak them in bear grease and make them waterproof. They would build kegs or, or what we uh, call hogsheads, which was not a rounded barrel like a cooperage barrel, but a hogshead was a straight-sided barrel about three foot in diameter. When when it was filled with salt, it weighed about a thousand pounds. So they would put tobacco, furs, hogshead, everything in that, and then that would be more like a tight keg. And they had they would grease it to, on the outside to make it waterproof, but that would only last so long. Now you take this boat; it was a problem because as soon as this boat hung on a snag or slid up on a on a sandbar, it would rack, and that would open up all the cracks, and water would rush in, no matter how well they had corked it. So they there was a I've got diagrams of pumps a wooden box pump that had a leather boot in it, and they would have two or three guys whose job was to pump that boat all the time, keep the water out, because they, they are always at jeopardy of losing the whole load, you know, losing everything they had. And so they worked so hard at it day and night to, to make it to market. And many boats would go down and, and, and sink, and they'd lose, you know, the, the river probably was very salty. <laughs> <laughs> because they were spilling it and they were sinking a few and 
is that that's the way it was. You know. What did they caulk the boat with? They used, uh, actually they used a lot of hemp rope, which they used for sailing all, all over the world for many uh, centuries. They used the cotton, which would swell up and tar it or, or use bear grease on it or, or hog grease. Anything that would make that sticky and pack it up. I took a boat down to Mississippi last year and we uh, were taking water over the bow because the current was so tough and uh, we were using everything we could to patch cracks in the, hole, in the bottom and I'm sure that's the way they were. They used whatever came handy to do that job but they had a knowledge, they had a mental ability, a way that already figured out of what, if this went wrong, here's what we do. And so... They, they, just like we are ingenuity today in our world of computers, they were unbelievably sharp with what they had to deal with back tho in those days. Of course, you see a lot of furs. There's the coyote, skunks. Uh, they had a lot of beaver, some beaver, deer skins. They sold everything. They kept everything and sold it <clears throat> and hauled it. How do they steer it? Steering on this boat uh, is done by that rudder right back there oh, you see there. sticking off the back oh, yeah, end yeah. that that would be the stern of the boat yeah. that rudder sticks off the rear now they yeah. would put a rudder off both ends it, that would be the rudder if you put one off the front it's called a gouger and the problem is that you think about this boat floating with the current the boat's going the same speed the water you can't make this boat go left or right with a rudder if the rudder's floating the same speed of the water so yeah. you have these oars and you need to pick up speed about a mile, an hour, faster than the current. So you just got to get the go boat to go on a little faster than the current. And then the rudder begins to work for you and you could get over to shore if you needed to. Plus they had these grappling hooks with a rope on them. They, if they decided the current's running, they're going to have to stop at this little town. They'd take grappling hooks and hook a tree. And there was a term for that. It was called a round two. And the captain would call for, we're coming up on this village, guys. The current's too fast. We need to make a round two. So everybody knew, grab a couple of grappling hooks and let's hook a tree and tie it off to one of the cables, those posts sticking up on the front. And the boat would just slowly swap ends and swing right up to the shore and land yeah. in, a, in a current. So they knew, they had terminology, they knew how to do it, and they were prepared in most instances for whatever came along. You'll notice candles. <clears throat> this is what I call a, two, a four candle power flashlight right here. You got two real candles and two reflections, which is four candle power. That's a, that's a fact, okay? Uh, I had a tin bender friend. A lot, they had a lot of stuff made by tin smiths and copper smiths like this. They had the, the felling axes like you see on the wall, draw knives. Froze like this one laying right here to split wood for shingles. Barrels, kegs like this with the hickory strap on them. Pulleys for raising stuff and pulling stuff. They knew how to use leverages, wedges, and make things happen that way.